Why don't we go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, if you have filled out a public comment card, yes, thank you. Please pass it up this way. We'll go in the order that they receive. Do we public comment card? Yes, you can pass them up. Can I ask you? Yeah. Sure. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We felt it. Okay. 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 You want to fill one out or no? You're good? So public comment is one minute for each item up to a maximum of three minutes. We will go in the order. Federation of State County Municipal Employees, retiree, Chapter 36, um, uh, which is a supporter of the End Homelessness Now LA campaign. And I'm here today to provide some general public comment to speak, of course, for housing and uh, against the comprehensive cleaning plan that's proposed. Um, I have read the plan and I have to take exception to this point of the uh, fully enforcement of 56.11 at every location. Okay, I want to bring up a huge contradiction here. Electric scooters are allowed to be anywhere. I can hardly get to a bus stop sometimes. So the particular focus on people that are intense, I find just really uh, cruel and unnecessary. We've got to have housing. I want to also ask the committee if you would walk down First Street between Broadway and Spring. This is a perfect example. You've got tents all around the fence of a park that is going to be turned into a lovely park. Well, my suggestion would be let's put some uh, toilets and showers and laundry and maybe put um, you know, the tents could be on the other side of the fence so that you don't have to harass people every day and move them off the street. What's happening is extremely I'm a frequent bus rider, subway rider, and every day I see many, many police standing there. They could be used in other ways. For example, helping pedestrians who almost get hit every day in crosswalks. That could just be one example. But I want to also propose uh, that your committee look at um, what the End Homelessness Now campaign is uh, proposing in terms of a concrete way to get this housing built faster, cheaper, ASAP, so that people who are having to live in tents or in their vehicles can be housed. And this is um, a proposal before the city and many council members is to use vacant city properties and vacant buildings for housing immediately. And this could be done with public housing. Uh, there's going to be a rally on February 15th. I'll just give this to you to enter into the record at 60th and Western, we are calling on Her uh, Council Member Harris Dawson to initiate the zoning and planning changes that would pave the way to build the kind of housing we're talking about on the 121,000 square foot vacant city lot at 60th and Southwestern. This is concrete. The city, I wish they would provide a plan like this for this instead of the oppression and harassment of people that are in the streets. I would say most of which not due to their own choosing. Um, I'm a retiree. I know the fastest increasing population of homeless people are those who are retired. Uh, so if you have to comment, you can finish your thoughts. All right, thank you. So I'll try to, but I think my main point here and what I see as someone who is taking public transportation is as a public sector worker, I know who has built this city. Black and Latino workers are a huge part of that. And blacks are at 9% of the population, are 40% of the homeless population, the unhoused population. 
this is really not acceptable, and something needs to happen. And I hope you will look at the proposal of our and the Homeless Systems LA Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the people who have just come into the room, there's public uh, comment cards up at the table for the time. Uh, next is Nicholas. Um, Nicholas, you didn't identify which item you from. Uh, general comment and or general and uh, item uh, three. So okay, so two minutes. Hi, my name is Nicholas Evans. I'm with uh, Cape Town for All. Uh, in recent weeks, we've seen an increase in sweeps, or as some people like to uh, euphemistically call them, service days, and in a, step, a step up of enforcement in 5611. Uh, 5611 serves no practical purpose other than to inconvenience, displace, and criminalize your unhoused neighbors. The tense down rule doesn't do anything to solve homelessness, and it doesn't benefit if, anyone living in Los Angeles, housed or unhoused. The tense down rule only tense down rule's only goal is to make homelessness less visible. It doesn't actually solve any problems. The enforcement-based approach is ineffective and life-threatening. Instead, we need courage from politicians on housing policy. We desperately need affordable housing, public housing, shelters, and supportive housing. In the meantime, we need quality services for our unhoused neighbors. Uh, we can easily start with trash cans and restrooms. I know there is an uh, item on the agenda that said that we had uh, the fifth, the fifth uh, hygiene uh, station set up. We need so much more than that. That is just the beginning. We need way, way, way more. Uh, basic services like this will prevent everyone housed and un unhoused. Um, three unhoused people die in Los Angeles per day. We need to do better. Uh, I urge the city to take the, a compassionate and services-based approach and uh, and the main focus on enforcement and criminalization. That's all. Thank you. Next is Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, you didn't uh, say which item or um, item you want to take. Just a public comment and also a uh, um, uh, Yeah, number three and the general public comment. Okay, two minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rebecca. I live in District 5, and I'm here to ask you all at the UHRC Policy Group to please adopt a more humane policy towards our unsheltered Angelinos, because 5611 prioritizes visual cleanliness over the human rights and human dignity of our neighbors without walls. 5611 is just as cruel as it is wildly expensive. Um, housing is the best policy solution to protect the public health and the rights of all Angelinos. So along with my friends at the DSALA, I'm asking you to provide services and not sweeps. And please, let's end the oppressive enforcement of 5611. Thank you. Uh, next is... Good afternoon. The harsh enforcement of the 5611 law and policies with tents being down and packed up daily at 6 a.m. and all possessions in a 60-gallon garbage bag is cruel for disabled, sick, and elderly unhoused people. The entire justification for the tents down policy is rooted in the erasure of poor people hiding poverty rather than addressing it. Enforcing tents down is a disgusting reminder of how this city will dedicate their resources towards hiding poor people instead of helping them and giving them shelter during the day. We need real solutions for those who are unhoused and not just ways to appease housed folks. Unhoused people are dying every day in LA and this body should take actions to stop it rather than help cause the deaths. Thank you. Uh, next is Christopher. Christopher is uh, said by five and general public comment. Two minutes. Hello. Um, 
I watched uh, 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 some people come out um, with respect to the recreational vehicles pilot. Uh, I watched them uh, vaguely offer services. I watched them tow cars, and I watched them in concert with uh, parking enforcement ticket people uh, who are homeless and living in their RVs. Uh, I think it says here in the minutes from maybe the other one that uh, the rationale of the pilot program is not to impound more vehicles. But let me, let me just briefly speak on, on what this means. If you have people living in RVs, uh, and, and the, the, the sort of the idea was that, well, they're, they're tags. Uh, the registrations are expired, so we have the right. And absolutely, as a city, you do have the right to tow those people. But if your idea is to help, if your idea is to help your unhoused citizens, then uh, uh, towing their cars, putting them out on the streets, they can't afford, if they can't afford the ticket, if they can't afford the tag, what are, what are we doing? You're putting them on the streets, and as we all know, three people in Los Angeles die a day from exposure because of homelessness. We need to call this what this is, and, I, and I, I'm sure everyone here has the, the best of intentions and, and, and really does want to make a difference. I do strongly believe that. But you have to know, you have to know what that is. To put them out on the streets like that, if you want to help them, that is nothing short. If you know that three people die a day, that is nothing short of state-sponsored genocide. That's what that is. You are sending them out to die. There must be something to do. And I, and I, I think we know uh, there's plenty and plenty of solutions. I spoke briefly uh, uh, at City Council Earlier today, uh, uh, Mr. O'Farrell was uh, doing something in response to a, an action in Echo Lake. Was that two minutes? Yes, two minutes. You can finish your thought. Thank you. Um, Mr. O'Farrell was, was doing something uh, with respect to the action at Echo Park Lake 24-7 uh, 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 bathrooms uh, for hygiene. They're already open. That's not, that's not a, a solution to any problem because you're not working in concert with the people themselves, the unhoused citizens themselves, who could provide you with the information that you need to come to a solution. Thank you. Uh, so we've had a number of new people come in. Uh, there are public comment cards. Uh, there should be some left on the tables. Sir, I would just kindly ask you, the tables is for city departments. So, so if you wouldn't mind, just having okay, so a Even as a homeless service provider, yes. I can't see the table? Yes, sir. That's, that's kind of like the way the whole discrimination is like. You guys are talking about homelessness and homeless service practices in the test, and a lot of us really care about what's going on, and you guys think you guys have the authority to kind of like take, take shit? That's pretty messed up. Yeah. So once you, if you do fill out a public comment card, you could just pass it up. Uh, Next is Tommy. Uh, Tommy on item number three, the one minute. Yeah, general comment and number three. Um, so, uh, so I just want to let you all uh, know, like some of y'all tried after I came here two weeks ago to like fix things at the Trader Enforcement Center in Hollywood, but it is a, still a fucking nightmare. Like y'all sent someone from your office down there to like try and make sure it was done nicely, but uh, and it was while they were there. But guess what? The cops really, really want people out of there, and they have their ways. Because two hours after everybody got to move their stuff a block away from where they previously were, instead of having to formally go all the way out to the edge of the zone, the cops came back and said, oh, you have 10 minutes to move your stuff back to the original location, or else you're losing all of it. And guess how many people lost their things? There are six people out on the fucking streets without tents, without their possessions, with nothing. What are you going to do? Who's responsible? It's up to me now. Give me some fucking money. I'll give them tents. Just stop terrorizing people. There, is, there are so many re city resources spent here that do nothing to help people. Taking down tents does nothing to help people. Did you all consider disabled people, people who have skin conditions? I know people who have skin conditions that can't be out in the sun all day. Did you think about them? Did you think about people in wheelchairs that aren't able to constantly be moving their shit around? You think people got nothing to fucking do? There are people out there all day watching their stuff for their friends, dragging their 60 pounds of shit up and down the fucking block all day for no goddamn reason. For no goddamn reason. You are trying to erase these people. The block is fucking clean. The sanitation worker refuses to answer our question when we ask, do you need to clean here? I'm not going to answer that question for you today. We know 
This isn't about cleaning the streets. You have told us so yourselves. We know this is about hiding poverty. We know this is not about helping people. Your time is up. You can finish your thought. Okay. Next is uh, Miguel. You didn't say which item or item. Uh, general and 3B. Okay. So two minutes. Hi, I'm Miguel Hamnitzer. I'm with Street Watch, DSA LA, and the Services Not Streets Coalition. Uh, I've been monitoring encampments in downtown for almost two years now, uh, and in that time I have met many unhoused folks with disabilities, uh, wheelchair users, people with mobility issues, veterans with lasting impairments, not to mention psychiatric disabilities, and their needs are completely neglected while the comfort of housed residents is prioritized. It strikes me as deeply cynical to weaponize ADA laws against uh, the most vulnerable disabled residents of our city, uh, whose health and safety is compromised uh, when you fixate on 36 inches from the curb. Um, also, the strategy for engaging unhoused people in encampments ignores the fact that these are vibrant, functioning communities with interpersonal support structures. When someone's tent is destroyed by the city, others will house them. Community members delegate uh, labor to clean sidewalks or trash and provide safety to one another. And when suites are implemented or services are provided, um, the city is erasing these community structures and atomizing individuals in ways that tear apart friends and family and neighbors. Uh, neighbors aren't even permitted to watch or protect each other's belongings during suites. Services need to be provided holistically uh, and communities need to be respected and not destroyed. Card we have is for the Cory. Yeah, there's a card. Uh, Cory, you did uh, identify your item. General? General. Yeah, I marked that box in there. Okay, so one minute. Thank you. These are not my words. These are words that were spoken December 3rd in the Weingart Garden of our State Assembly Special Council on Homelessness. And I quote from Santiago, I'm pissed. A quote from another one of our state assembly, the complexion of this is shocking. Another member of our city council, urgent, urgent, urgent. A reminder that money is power, but action is loyalty in this city. Everyone in this room has a duty for our human humanitarian crisis. There are thousands of people dying yearly in our neighborhoods, in our streets. We follow a, a federal model of housing first and harm reduction. And if they are our example, where are we at the bottom of that chain to not be applying that? Down to sweeps in a park is not harm reduction. I speak as a Skid Row Housing Trust resident, a formerly homeless person that lived three and a half years in motorhome in Hollywood. And these people here are people saving people's lives. Next is G, and you didn't identify which item or items. Uh, no problem. Okay, so one minute. Um, so I came last week when I came. You guys um, had on uh, sorry this whole the process again, but I think that the, the way you guys have it is very disrespectful because you guys have public comments in the beginning, and then you guys go up on your agenda, and then when if any one of us wants to talk about that agenda, we can't talk about it because it's considered quote unquote public comment. So there's no engagement. So um, we brought it to the table that in order for this to be this participatory democracy, like you guys should um, change your format because what it is, it's like, it's just like a check mark. You guys are just making us come up two, two minutes, then we shut up, you guys do your thing, and then like there's no engagement. And I think a lot of you guys sitting here on the table have compassion, but you guys feel obligated, you guys gotta go by what structure, you know? Um, criminalizing, I, last time I came, I asked a question, if, Homeless people were being were given tickets under 5611. You wouldn't let your coworker answer the question. So people are being giving tickets under 5611. They're basically criminalizing people for being on the streets. Three we cannot criminalize up, people for being on the streets. So like, what's the solution? There's no homeless service providers here. I'm a homeless service provider, and you're gonna you're quote unquote kicking me off the table because this is quote unquote has the power to dictate what's going on. My suggestion is that you guys change your structure 
and then have these type of meetings at a high school gym where the community can come and have the discussion instead of let it be a paid job. Can you guys do this on a Saturday at 10 a.m.? All right, uh, next item are the, looking at the minutes from the last meeting, approval of the minutes. Um, if you have a chance to review, let me know if there are any additional edits. My name's Phil Wrong. Oh. It has a T at the end of it. I'm the first one. Okay. Thank you. Scheller. Yes, ma'am. Okay, any other changes? Thank you. So, the next item, uh, an update from HCID on the Affordable Supportive and Economic Housing Project. This came as a request from the District 2. Is that? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so I don't know if there's anything that you um, want to say or we can go with you. I have quite a few. I didn't know the count, but I did ask beforehand, but did not get it. So if we need more copies, if you make more copies. Good afternoon, Ed Gibson from Housing Community Investment Department. To provide you an update specifically on the affordable housing and more specifically the support of housing uh, tied to measure uh, Proposition HHH. Um, Proposition HHH was passed in November 2016, $1.2 billion. Dollars. Money was allocated for supportive housing, affordable housing, and facilities to support uh, homeless activities inside the city. The, there's a Citizens Oversight Commission that sits over the top. They were brought together and their first meeting was held in February of 2017. In March of 2017, we brought forward our first projects, the first nine uh, for consideration for financing. And by that June, funds had been sold and um, we had money to start our first, first project, our first nine. HHH, just for a little bit more background, um, we tried to design that so that we could build housing as fast as possible. For those who know anything about construction or development in this city, it can take a great deal of time, has a lot of hurdles, and we still have to deal with all those hurdles. One of the things that we did is we worked on an existing model, which is partnering with different developers who specialize in this industry in order to develop affordable housing. We still have some new entrants to this industry, but uh, we partnered to develop with, with uh, the existing people who understand it. We took a process that on average they usually take about five years from beginning to end. It could take longer if you've seen anything being developed in the city. They tried to convince it. So we work on a three to five year time span, if you will, a very difficult challenge when you're assembling financing. The HHH funds do not pay for all of the housing costs. They pay for a portion of the housing costs. So the, the financing still must be assembled. So when we look look down, there's a lot of hurdles, places people have to visit in order to get this funding. Mm -hmm. I will say in December of this year, the first project opened, and that's basically three years. So on a record time span, we saw the first project to open for HHH, and people began occupancy into that building. So those are the first 66 units to come online. Um, I've handed you all um, a handout, which is copy of the dashboard, if you will, that we have on the website, plus a few additional slides. So if anybody didn't get a copy or wants to follow anything along or has questions later on, um, it's uh, hcidla.lacity.org. And you can do backslash HHA progress, or you can just wait for the banner to come by and you can click on it. That tells you exactly where we are at any given moment in time. Uh, as we update that, it gets updated a fifth of every single month. Um, things change here and there from month to month and we're in a very active environment. So I'll go on to say that to date, um, there have been 112 projects with commitments approved for just a little over $1 billion. That is a total of 7,465 7, units, 5,000 
764 are supportive housing, another 1,577 are affordable, and another 124 are manager's units, so there's someone on the side at all times. I will say some people ask me, why is there just regular affordable units? Well, one, HHH allows regular affordable units to help target the population as well. But in our world of very specific definitions of who's eligible, who's chronic, who's just homeless, there's many definitions. And each funding source has a different definition. And the one thing we wanted to make sure that could happen is that people got housed. So if we made sure to fund a few units that have complete affordability restrictions, but provided the latitude that if you didn't meet someone's exact model of what definition of homelessness is, but you were homeless, that you could get housing. So, with that said, um, at this moment, uh, we have 24 projects that have closed their financing uh, with us, combined with other folks' financing, so it is a Herculean lift. Uh, that's basically the equivalent of about 1,500, just shy of 1,600 um, units. 20 of those projects to date are actually uh, underway and in construction. So that's another 1,300 units approximately, the lower, that are under construction right now. Um, we have government insight, but when a project's over 65 units, we have more discussions about city money and other money being involved and how do we also help create jobs with local hire and give people employment along the way. So 33 of the 112 projects are 65 units and greater, as that is the trigger for a project labor agreement, which basically is triggering a local hire agreement. So people who live in the city, work in the city, can, uh, or just live in the city or in the city, can have the opportunity to be employed by these projects as well. So um, as I touched on, that first project was uh, received its certificate of occupancy at the end of December. That project's 88th in Vermont. I mention their name because when you do a Herculean lift in your first, you deserve to be recognized for your efforts. So um, that was by uh, Works and Community Build. Um, we expect in the next upcoming quarter that we will actually have another two projects complete construction. That'll be about another 239 units coming online. Um, and then also in the next quarter we expect uh, that ends uh, March 31st. A total of, um, I want to say about eight additional projects going into construction. We're, we're a lot of busy. That would be at about another 451 units being put under construction. Um, I was just going to say that that's part of the HHH. Part of our plan for supportive housing doesn't just rely on HHH. We have another existing affordable housing inside the city um, that has um, no HH involved, HHH involved, and we have been doing that practice for a number of years. But as HHH was developed to deal with the fact of we can only do as much as capital as we have to put forward, HHH came forth to help finance those, um, more of those. So, but in our regular pipeline, we actually have 31 non-HHH housing projects with another 1,300 units. So when you just look at between the two programs, HHH and our non-HHH supportive housing program, that's 7,064 units coming in with a portion of them online already. Of the two handouts um, I've provided, um, the one with the dashboard, uh, a little bit more colorful, multi-page, can take you through the process. It talks at the very, you know, basically on the very first page of the presentation, 10-year timeline. HHH was tied to a 10-year authorization for the bonds. A very tight timeline if anybody's familiar with development. A very challenging if anybody knows how to develop anything inside this city with various land issues, entitlement issues, and all the challenges that come forth when you find a piece of, piece of land here. We're working very hard to make sure we hit that goal. We're, we're working very hard to hit that goal. Um, and you can see every step of the way on the dashboard, which is a picture of right there, um, where we stand. Um, on the second page of the slide, which is technically page three, is the breakdown between our non-HHH and our um, HHH funded projects. Um, I would also say that a number of these projects that are coming forth are on city-owned land. 
So approximately 18 to 19 of these sites are city-owned parcels. City-owned parcels are good in helping to reduce the cost. We tend to ground lease them. They will be affordable forever. But they also have challenges where if you know, it's a parking lot or something else or something spilled on it, it has to be cleaned up or addressed or parking has to be replaced at times, which provides additional <coughs> challenges that we work through every day. Um, to date, I mentioned there's about a billion dollars committed. Um, with that billion dollars, that does not mean we have spent a billion dollars. Great deal of people ask us many questions about, hey, you've given these folks money, you've given this private sector development who you partner with money. We pay on a reimbursement basis. That's not to say that it's not without challenges. You do the work, we pay. That's how the construction industry works. If it's an acquisition of a site, we appraise the site, we pay for the site, you give us ownership of the site into the development, and there and there we go. So the, with that one being a commitment just a little bit over, that leaves about 200 million. Just remembering a portion of that was used for facilities, which is a separate program, which may include some transitional housing, and that is run by the Chief Administrative Officer's office. Um, and so there's that little piece. And then there's a portion of funds of about $120 million where the, the mayor sponsored with the Citizens Oversight Commission a HHH Housing Innovation Challenge. Their goal, quite honestly, was to see is there another way to build faster in the timeline that we have put forward. With that said, $120 million was set aside. Six project teams were brought together, and their goal was to produce approximately 1,000 units. Their also goal was to have to produce those units within a two-year time frame, a very, a very tight window. The expectation is that they would be using alternative methods than what we've seen to date with how we leverage, and they're off on their way. I know a good number of sites have been identified under their program. All MOUs with the six development teams have been executed, so they are in site acquisition and identification mode at this particular moment in time. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. And then the other handout you have is a frequently <coughs> asked question for a flyer. Um, we get a lot of different questions. A lot of stuff's posted on our website, but some of the big questions uh, have come up, and so they've tried to put them here in this little flyer. People hear things from time to time, like there's no progress. There's a lot of progress. A lot of work's done now. People hear from time to time that the units are very expensive. Units and housing in this city, unfortunately, is very expensive, and we do our very best to try to keep uh, control of the cost. But one, we're not paying for the entire thing. So with that, if you keep driving up the cost, you have a bigger gap to do. And the commitments we gave you, once we gave you a commitment, was for two years for you to get into construction. So um, it doesn't behoove you to try to drive up the cost. We have limits on developer fee. And I'll add, when people discuss, hey, I heard it cost $550,000 a year, Mr. Gibson. I go, that particular project did. That project may be six feet high. Six stories high, commercial prevailing wage, maybe over 65 units, project labor agreement. Each one has its own a story to tell, but the real balance is when I said 550, 560, it was all in. It includes the developer's profit, it includes the cost of the land, it includes the cost of the financing, it includes the construction cost. It's not just the low number that sits in there. Most people always compare just the construction number and let you think it's the same. It's not quite the same. Ours is an all-in, so we know exactly what people are spending and how they're spending it. And that's how we help try to contain those costs with leveraging with our partners. And with that, happy to Chris, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you've been doing a lot of work in the last year. Thank you. 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 Thank um, 1,577 were uh, carved out for affordable, affordable housing units, right? At the, yes. Okay. 15, 1,577 are just targeted at affordable. So that would be at 60% of area median income or less. That's what I was going to say. Are, are they all at that 60% or are some of them? Uh, the there's a couple that are a touch higher, but uh, for the most part, the program for those is at 60% of the income. So people had the option of uh, how, how they designated when they came forward. If you wanted to do your entire building, 
we were prepared to do that. If you were uh, as homeless um, uh, housing and, and brought in and um, filled up by the coordinated entry system. If you were um, doing just half under that method, but you also wanted to serve the homeless on the other half, we followed that method as well. We just didn't fund you to the same level. But we recognize not everybody fits in this model, so you might need these. So you'll, you'll see some that are like 85% strictly homeless and another 15% um, just affordable. So they make sure they can catch the people who they need to catch when they need to catch them. So you, you have a choice. And then in the, in the dashboard, if people wanted to find out information about a specific project, does the dashboard get that? that granular or is it mostly? Yes, it does. So if you go to page six and page seven and you look at the bottom of that, that screen, <coughs> uh, that shot of the PowerPoint, you can see addresses, developer, address, you can see units, location, it gets granular. If you want to do a search on where we made commitments in the city, we're in every single council district. If you want to go just the specific council district, you can do that. That data is downloadable, that data is searchable, so you can figure out exactly where we are and what we're doing at any given moment in, in time inside there, and who's under construction, and, and who's completed. That's all, that's all registered. Would you entertain a second question from the audience? Uh, that's up to me. Yeah, sorry, you, you can try and catch that afterwards. But not, I think that would be important because there's a lot of questions around why this money for unhoused people is, is being used for people that are not. And the voters voted for Prop HHH thinking it was all going to go to unhoused people. So I think the city needs so to come forward so and be more honest about what's actually going on with this money going to private developers when they could have built the housing themselves and gotten rid of the middleman. Let, let me, let, I, I apologize for interjecting and going to answer her question. Because I think there is a great misunderstanding about HHH and the details of how people actually run it. HHH was passed with these terms inside of it. Um, and this is housing and funds to support homelessness. And that is what they are being used for is to support all those activities and every function that you believe in. We are audited annually, so no doubt that. I will say that in the interest of time, no entity has enough money. A billion dollars is not enough to build this many units. It must be leveraged, and it must be leveraged with partners who will come together or we will have less. There is no governmental entity of any size large enough to actually construct this type of housing. Cities, governments do not build apartment buildings, not in California, not in the US. Developers do that, a very intricate process. In, in order to meet certain speeds, I'm just, I'm just gonna, just oh, governmental, just let, let me finish. finish, let me finish. I know we'll have difference of opinions because that's how it always be. But the reality is, when you are looking to move quickly, and the costs actually are somewhat cheaper in the private sector, and you control what profit they're allowed to make, and you bring in partners with experience, you will have results, and you'll move timely. If you stay with small entities, governmental entities, who do not have the capacity, this process will take a great deal of time, and honestly, we do not have that time to waste. We are the supportive housing group, we are responsible for the permanent side, and we're trying to make sure we're coming online as fast as we can. We're not the only piece, but we are. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Uh, you coming today. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the, the CARE program, and, and we can get department report backs. And uh, we can start with uh, a report from Boston. Yeah. Um, I'm Karen Hager Lyons, and I'm in the city. I'm step in this morning. Um, the attorney, uh, since the last two weeks when we met, the attorney don't have any matrix as uh, we're working on another expert guidance of big uh, for uh, requested. Um, uh, but we're also hoping to include um, what came up last last time, which was like how many uh, new encounters versus the existing clients, so uh, putting those two together as well. Uh, updates, um, we're trying to 
so access and engagement is a lot larger department than, than just the care employees. So we're trying to uh, be mindful and not schedule anything that would impact uh, the care activities. For example, today there's a, a department meeting this afternoon. We did in the afternoon not to impact care uh, head members. Um, another thing, uh, we're having CPR trainings for all of our care members, and we're doing it over two months and four different days, again, to minimize any impact and have coverage from our regular head team members to cover the care activities as well, as much as we can and have minimal impact. Um, we also had like a uh, conference call for all our care team members on Friday and one for care plus team members on Monday. Um, just to keep updated, um, there's a lot of new information and updates we got from our partners and agencies as well. Um, so just make sure to streamline and get the information disseminated to our, to our head members as soon as possible so they're not cut off guard with any new information that they haven't heard that was in streamlined to us. <coughs> Question for last one. They don't think I see a representative of sanitation here. Unfortunate. But uh, we can move on to uh, LAPD. It's nothing really new to report. Um, if our last full month of uh, their operation December, that was the LAPD units responded to approximately 8.2% of the total number of cleanups citywide. It's you know, still responding to less than 10% of the total cleanups. So losses out there between the engagement and sanitation in the cleanup that we're not even in the picture at all for the vast majority of the cleanups. I still have four supervisors and 42 officers assigned to the homeless outreach and product engagement team citywide. We have uh, two more coming online hopefully next month, two more officers. And we're going to be doing um, citywide training next month for all of our senior lead officers and kind of reiterating the, uh, the care program and, and their, their roles and responsibilities when they're requested to go out to a care uh, cleanup. And the two additional officers, those are South 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 Crow, right? Okay. Um, your team's making the report? Uh, we're uh, working with traffic control to provide a safe environment for the cleanups and doing signposting for the mobile hygiene station uh, daily, uh, probably about 30 with signs. Any questions from any of the Council officers about care programs? No. As far as us, get the hygiene units out there assigned to We started working more um, with the DOC with regards to the homeless deaths. Um, we started sharing that information with LASA um, so that their outreach workers, if they have worked with those folks in the field, are aware of what's happened um, and they then go out there to provide support. Um, so uh, the Department of Communication emails now will include whether or not the person <coughs> was somebody who experienced homeless or not, like they did with the games. They still do with gang activity. So, so the department, we're trying to do a better job of tracking whether a victim, suspect, or individual <coughs> um, involved in a criminal incident or was a victim of a criminal incident was experiencing homelessness. And that has been part of the, uh, the process when the, our uh, DOC sends out communications. <coughs> so for someone who is either a victim of a, of a violent crime, whether they were experiencing homelessness, and that information is going to be shared along with your office and you want to pass along to LASA, we'll, we'll include LASA in, those, uh, in that information also. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything today about the RV uh, pilot program? Anything to report? No, um, we're going to report the fourth week is tomorrow. Uh, we've seen a lot of positive results um, in the neighborhood. A lot more engagement from the people living in the RV, so they are uh, they actually just come right up to the table. more familiar with us and the outreach workers, and because of that, they're more willing to accept services. Are you out with this team? Yeah. So 
Did you get anything to report from the losses perspective? Uh, not right now, but just like she mentioned, like um, as as any pilot progresses and 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 it becomes more familiar, uh, not just the employees, but also the people being served, like uh, there tends to be more people. Oh, DOT. item is a report from our Bureau of Street Lighting about uh, illegal power tapping and this was a request from our council office. Do you want to start off or just... No, yeah, just kind of get the lay of the land. Obviously our office has been in contact with GSL because we have had a few of our major corridors to license them off. So we wanted to track that. about our copper wire and power theft. We, it's a combined problem that we have. Um, it's been a problem that we've had for quite a while, but uh, just in, within the last two years, uh, basically it's wrapped up significantly. Um, really what it is is a combination of wire and power theft that we've been experiencing. So this all started early in the 2000s, but mostly back then it was mostly wire theft. So now we're seeing a lot of power theft. Um, I brought a map that kind of shows the last the last calendar year where this is happening, so the map on the left shows basically where all the copper wire power theft is happening. We see a lot of the valley up in the north, but we also see a lot in the, the central and, and south, south LA. So it is something that is really significantly impacting our resources. So when there's some kind of wire or power theft, basically it impacts the lights. So we'll have blocks and blocks of lights out uh, if somebody's either tapping into the power or uh, stealing wires, so you'll end up with blocks of lights out. And a lot of times what happens is our crews have a, basically when they respond, it turns into kind of a construction project. So if you look at some of the damage that's been done on the side, it's not as easy as fixing a lamp. You have to go in there, sometimes you have to pull the wire, uh, we have to fix holes. We do tend to weld our, our hand holes in order to basically keep people from impacting the street lighting system, because once the, the, the power is out for blocks, you know, it impacts everybody. It's just it's the residents, it's the people who are using the streets, as well as the people who are on the streets. So this is a problem that we're we're trying to tackle. We don't we're basically our resources are taxed. So we've been working on a couple different measures. Um, this kind of outlines some of the measures that um, we've been working on. So at the bottom, you know, we started in 2008 with this, but back then it was mostly wire theft. So we worked with the with the city attorney's office to get the uh, penal codes in place, um, and we started getting welders because. Where we see the impact is either in the pool boxes or in the handholds. So our boxes, we, we've been locking our boxes. In some areas, we actually bury them be beneath the concrete. And then our handholds, we usually have to get welders out there to weld them shut. A lot of times, even though we, when we weld them shut, people go through the actual, um, it's welded, but they actually just find a way to get in. So it's a significant problem. Uh, sorry, can I, can you, okay. I'm trying to this way. Yeah. Everybody's seen it already, right? Okay. Um, so basically, we've been working on a couple things. Uh, we're trying to hire additional resources. We're asking for, we're, we basically have a handhold crew that just goes around and basically tries to put the, the lids back on because it's become a safety issue when we've got wires exposed. Kids walking by, things like that. Uh, we've had some deaths uh, because of this. So it is something that we're trying to work on. We weld our handholds, like I mentioned. We put our boxes under cement. Um, we have been working with some security cameras just to kind of put out there. We've been working with sanitation and security cameras 
And we're trying to put some funding in mid-year for resources, but not just that, we're tr we talk to street services to work with their enforcement team to help us. A lot of times what happens is we go out, we can't get access to the poll, so we have to come back later. Sometimes we talk to whoever's adjacent to the poll and we tell them, you know, we have to get access to the poll. Sometimes they let us, sometimes they tell us, okay, well, well I'm leaving on Tuesday and we've actually made appointments with them to come back and, and actually fix the lights. We get them back up, sometimes they get hit again, we get, you know, hit a couple, several times at the same location. Um, so we do work closely with the council offices to try, but we know that there's this lights out for, and our, our basically our turnaround times are quite significant. Because this, since this is drawing all our resources to uh, copper wire power theft, all the single lights out, you know, they're kind of left on the side and those turnaround times are also increasing. So it is a problem that we're working with, um, you know, we're working with the mayor's office. We're just continuing to work on it. <laughs> uh, what's the what generally is the appropriate way to report? I mean, like if one were walking down the street and they saw the light so they should report it through three one one. Um, you know, it's but and if it's something that's really hazardous, like if there's wires exposed, you should probably just call our office directly because three one one is inundated with a lot of these these calls. So a lot of the council offices know who to call at our office um, because we consider that more of a safety issue especially if you're a school, a park, anything where there's like kids running around. Um, so it's best to, if there's something really dangerous to give us a call directly. We have been working with care teams a bit. Um, they do call us to go with them once in a while because uh, as they go through, a lot of times um, there's power, power being attached, so we disconnect before the, the teams go through. And then we come afterwards to basically repair the system. Um, so that's really how we've been, we've been tackling it. We're always looking for other ideas. Um, you know, we have also been asked to basically put some, you know, USBs in our pool, uh, actually USBs, and we have done some of that actually out there, uh, just to see how that would work, because we know that the power is being used for either the phones or um, whether other devices that they have. So we have put some USBs out there, um, and it's become a little bit of a maintenance issue, but we are looking into that, because I know people have brought that up. Are you tracking usage of the, the lights of the USB? No, there's no way to track how much usage come, is being used from that, and it's such a small amount that um, we don't really have a way of tracking it. Is that a significant additional cost for the add-up? It's not a significant cost to add it, it's a significant cost to maintain it. Yeah. So we have some, and it's like, they also have the bus shelters, if you've seen, uh, they have some of those. So it becomes a little bit of a maintenance problem because uh, they will, people will, will destroy it and then have to go out and, and basically put a new one in. So the maintenance is really the problem. The cost to install is not, not as big. Yeah. Any questions? No, I just want, I'm glad you guys are better coordinated with the care team because that, as you can see on the map, um, the council district is heavily affected by those um, free light outages. We yeah. get calls all day long from parents and residents. Or, you know, not feeling safe to come in because it gets where they're going. So, and, you know, obviously working with the outreach workers to identify those locations where right. that's taking place. Because I've been out there many times and speak with your crews. I mean, they're just the close calls as far as individuals tapping into those wires. You know, God forbid something happens. But fortunately, I haven't come across that situation yet. But we want to do all that we can. Right. 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 Yeah. So, I mean, electricity is dangerous. Have low and high voltage systems, people don't know which ones are which, so it is it can be pretty dangerous. All the council offices we do, we encourage uh, any council office who wants to work with us can work closely. We can provide maps because what happens is, you know, there's there's tons of outages in a council districts sometimes, and we are just tackling them as they come in. But there might be priorities that they have that we don't know about, so we always encourage them if they want us to come out and show them what their district looks like, and if they want to tell us what their priorities, we will redirect the crews to go to that priority first. But yeah, right now our turnaround times are quite significant, um, longer than we would like them to be. Do you meet with the council officers regularly or, or? So we do meet with, we do talk, I mean, we hear from the ones that are basically <coughs> impacted. We do send letters out to them um, annually to let them know, you know, all their the stuff that's happening in their district, also to point out that um, this is a problem and that they should be aware of it. 
and that people should report when they see some copper or power theft going on so that we don't have lights out for those blocks at a time. So we are trying to work with them um, and with work with yeah, your you know, office. Like, uh, but and I would love to follow maybe with even some of our schools and parents so that we can learn what to do. I mean, what I, I, yeah, we would love to do that uh, because, you know, they don't understand that they think that, you know, that why haven't they fixed the light? And, and it's because we're over here fixing 100 more over here. So, and sometimes if there's a school or something that's a priority, we will divert crews. And we're, we're basically, we've maxed out on our resources. We have maximum overtime. I mean, it's just one of those things that it's overwhelming. Yeah. Every complaint should be accompanied with power for the unhoused residents. Are there any other questions for Norma? Power banks. It's a human need. Sure. Um, so I think that's an interesting, interesting question um, about how to coordinate those. Uh, because you're more directly with the chair of the council offices. Some kind of a regular motion from four or five years ago. It will be in this room. Um, I just need to confirm that with the CAO. Uh, if not, uh, it will be on the agenda. Uh, again, you can sign up to receive the agenda on the city clerk uh, website. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, we can adjourn. Thank you. <laughs>